thank you for joining us today. Our reporters, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves and then we're gonna switch it up and you know, ask that you keep your cameras on. So um, let's start with uh, Ricardo. Hi there, welcome. Hello. And can you introduce yourself and your outlet? Um, I am uh, Ricardo Laranava. I'm a reporter for LA Nidor News, HSU's uh, bilingual student-run newspaper. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Austin, yeah. do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Austin Castro, and I am a reporter for News in Eureka. Welcome. Ali? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ali Hostler. I'm the editor of the Two Rivers Tribune out in Hoopa. Welcome, welcome, Ali. Ryan? My video is not working. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, well, that's one. Um, good morning. This is Ryan Hudson. I'm with the Redheaded Black Belt, and I'll try to correct my video. All right, welcome. Thanks. Hi, Kim. Oh. Hi, this is Kim Ware with the North Coast Journal. Welcome, Kim. And my name is Christine Messenger. Um, welcome to the December 1st COVID-19 virtual news conference. I'm one of the public information officers for the COVID-19 Joint Information Center. And today we are joined by Humboldt County Health Director, Sophia Pereira, and Humboldt County Health Officer, Ian, Dr. Ian Hoffman. Sophia, can you give us a few words? Absolutely, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so you may have heard that Governor Newsom is actually doing a press conference right now at the same time as our presser here. Uh, we've seen the report of the first Omicron case in California in the United States, and our team is following these updates closely, and we will incorporate any new guidance that comes down from CDPH. So I just wanted to acknowledge that given that there's some, some stuff happening in real time right now as we are in this uh, presser together. Uh, a couple of things that I also wanted to touch on. Uh, first, uh, we have a lab, a public health lab leadership update. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Corrigan, who you all know as our lab manager, after 12 years of service in our public health lab, uh, is actually moving on to be the lab director for San Diego County. So we are so grateful for Jeremy's uh, tireless leadership. Uh, he has helped to grow our lab's capacity to meet the demand for testing for, for COVID-19 um, and all the other work that he's done outside of COVID-19. Um, with our bioterrorism lab, et cetera. So really sad to see him go and we truly wish him all the best in San Diego where I know he'll continue to do great things. We are though also excited to announce that we have our new lab director that has started this week, Dr. Pepper Stockton. Pepper joins our leadership team after serving as the lab director for Shasta County. He does have roots in this community. He's lived here before. And together, Jeremy and Pepper have been working really closely together to ensure that it's a smooth transition. So we're really uh, thrilled to uh, announce this transition and welcome uh, Pepper to the Humboldt County Public Health team. Uh, and then on, a, on another note, I, I did also just wanna speak to uh, the importance of these pressers. Uh, they're important to us here in public health. They're important to the public. And so last week uh, we did get together and discuss the need to provide them more regularly. Um, that's something that I think we all have a shared interest in. And frankly, just one of the challenges has been for us is the human resources side of it. The staffing challenges have really been driving a lot of our decision making. And unfortunately, that's unlikely to change for the foreseeable future. We're just uh, adapting where we can. Um, but that said, we are still committed and renewing our commitment to continuing to provide these daily updates that we do to field questions as they come in, as we are able to, uh, and to provide uh, regular updates to the Board of Supervisors and to hold uh, these pressers at least twice a month. Uh, in fact, we plan to uh, hold another presser this next week as well. Uh, and we would like to do more. Um, and unfortunately, that's what we can do right now with the resources that we have. And then lastly, just, <laughs> kind of connected in terms of sharing information with the public. Our dashboard obviously has been a resource folks have you know, been tracking closely. It's something we're really proud of. Um, and our epidemiologists um, have been working really hard 
on developing a new dashboard. It's still being developed. It's still being worked on um, while they're balancing all the other work that they're doing. So just wanted to, we've brought it up before that's being worked on. And I just didn't want to lose track of that in terms of educating the public that that's something that's still happening uh, behind the scenes. And we hope, um, I, I don't want to say a date because I, you know, you say something and then you jinx yourself of when it gets launched, but they're working really hard to get something out uh, with a, a, a really great new dashboard. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Sophia, um, and thanks for everyone for being here today. Um, yeah, I'll also echo, um, you know, welcome to uh, Dr. Pepper Stockton. We are so grateful for him to be here. He's uh, um, stepping into some very big shoes uh, with Dr. Corrigan leaving. We, uh, you know, have been so blessed to have him over the, the course of the last 12 years and wish him the best of luck. Um, he's, he's been a wonderful asset to, to our organization for such a long time. Um, I uh, want to start off with a couple brief updates. Um, so we all know about uh, Omicron and it's, uh, you know, as Sophia mentioned, it's here now in California as of a few hours ago. Um, Locally, some things that we're, we're doing, um, you know, we're gonna, we put out uh, um, some information to the medical community uh, over the last 24 hours about, um, you know, getting enhanced travel histories and, um, and really any, we're encouraging anyone who's had international travel in the last 14 days to go ahead and get tested. Um, and if those, if those are being tested locally here, um, by one of our, our doctors that they should send those to our public health lab so we can expedite them if they are positive for uh, whole genome sequencing. Um, we're looking for other ways to try to do enhanced screening of returning travelers. Um, you know, that's going to be the focus. We don't think that this is circulating locally, although there certainly probably are some cases, you know, in California and across the country of travelers um, from the areas that have seen uh, Omicron in the last, uh, you know, few weeks. Um, so locally, our case counts are are improved. They're stabilized for several weeks now. We've we've seen really that that peak that we saw a few months ago come come down. Um, we've been fairly stable now. Um, that case rate is still fairly high compared to where we were even a, a year ago. Um, before the first surge. So we are aware that, you know, the, the, the case counts, um, while they're improved, they, they still remain high. And our hospitalizations are also greatly improved, but still also remain fairly high, uh, rates higher than they have been at any point before um, the Delta surge that we experienced in the past few months. So um, we're keeping a close eye on that. Um, and we're keeping a close eye on our vaccine progress. I think that's, you know, really, uh, our goal right now is uh, continue to, to increase um, access and reduce barriers to, to the vaccine. Um, we're, you know, I, latest review of the numbers um, really are in, very encouraging. Um, we have um, upwards of about 20% of the five to 11 year olds with, uh, with their first shot, which is incredible um, to have that done in just a few weeks. Um, we're really excited for that and encouraged by those numbers and want to see that continue to go up um, as the mo local medical community continues to vaccinate the 5 to 11 year old group. Um, we're up to 50% of the uh, uh, 12 to 17 year old group also fully vaccinated now, um, which is extremely encouraging and, and overall of the entire eligible population in Humboldt County, about three out of four people have received at least one shot. So, you know, that means really if we look around, most people in our community have gotten a shot um, and, you know, believe in the confidence uh, and the science and the evidence behind these, these vaccines, which are highly effective, they're very safe, the majority of our community has already gotten one, um, and they will be the thing that will, will end this for all of us. So, um, encouraging numbers, we, we hope they continue to go up, and look forward to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So each reporter will have the opportunity to ask a question and then have a brief follow-up discussion with the panelists before we move to the next reporter. And just a reminder that we are gonna be ending today at 1245. 
So I'm going to go in order of how you are on my screen. Ricardo, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, South Africa's Department of Health uh, recently found that 10% of those infected with a new variant are uh, kids under two. Um, what advice do you have for parents who, with children, to protect their children from COVID? Thanks, Ricardo. This is a great question. I, I hadn't seen that um, data yet, but um, you know what we know about all of the variants of uh, COVID is that they can infect everyone, and um, you know certainly that under five population who you know can't get a vaccine yet um, are are still vulnerable. Um, so you know for everyone who should be wearing a mask, I think you know that's really the the main thing that, that we have right now, um, besides vaccine, if you're eligible for a vaccine, I definitely get one. Um, like I said, they're safe, they're effective, um, they protect yourself, they protect your community. Um, and, you know, as, as far as, um, you know, younger kids and other ways that you can protect them is, you know, try to keep them out of crowded public spaces, um, you know, avoid large gatherings uh, until, we have this pandemic under control. And, um, you know, if you are in those spaces and they're uh, over the age of two and can safely wear a mask, you know, make sure that they're wearing a mask as well. Do you have any follow-up, Ricardo? No, thank you. Thank you. Austin, do you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to know, of course, we have all this talk about the Omicron variant. And of course, with the holidays right around the corner, should people anticipate the possibility of another lockdown or additional restrictions? Yeah, I think, you know, the first part of the question is, um, are we expecting another surge? And I think the answer is we are definitely expecting another surge of cases. Um, you know, what that is going to look like is, you know, we, we're constantly been playing this game the whole pandemic, um, trying to predict the future. Um, you know, with with Omicron, it's really we're, we're, we're in a holding pattern now. We just don't know. We know it's more transmissible. Uh, we're seeing that data both in the mutations, but also in uh, the rate at which it's increasing in, in the Southern African uh countries where, where it's circulating. Um, but what we don't know is, is it, is it as deadly? Is it as, is it causing as severe a disease? Um, and then how is it interacting with people who were previously infected or had a vaccine? So, um, you know, yes, we expect a, a surge in cases. We don't know what's going to happen. I, I think in terms of our reaction to that, we, you know, we need to be mindful of what we have, which is vaccines. So everyone should get a vaccine. If you have your full vaccine and you're due for a booster, please get your booster. That's also going to be an effective tool. Um, please wear your mask. That's an extremely effective tool in public places. And, you know, until we know more about this, you know, you might want to consider things like avoiding large gatherings, limiting, you know, your, your larger social interactions, um, at, as far as other lockdowns, I, I'm not hearing anything on that. So I, I don't think that's a tool we're looking to go back to uh, it, unless there was some extraordinary uh, reason to, to go back to that. Great, thank you. Nice to have a quick follow-up. I mean, you talk about um, hopefully not going back to lockdowns. Could you confidently say at this point that we won't need to worry about more restrictions or a lockdown ahead of the holidays this month? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think that we're going to be watching things very closely. Um, it's not something that's even being discussed right now. So I, I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, it's something we should expect for sure. I think we should expect uh, increase in vaccination, first and second doses, and increase in boosters. Um, you know, thankfully, we have masks uh, still uh, required in our county, I think, uh, you know, puts us in a better position to, to deal with this as we learn more about uh, Omicron in the coming weeks and months. Um, and we'll wait and see. We're gonna, we monitor the cases, we monitor the hospitalizations, you know, daily and, and, and you know, see if there's any other actions that are needed um, 
but I, you know, I don't, there wouldn't necessarily be anything else locally that would be done. Those would be, you know, federal and state actions um, at this point. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Austin. Ali, do you have a question? Yeah, well, that was my question um, about foreseeable lockdowns or shutdowns in, in the near future. Um, so to go to a second question, um, how is the county continuing to work in rural communities and with tribal health organizations? Yeah, I, I can I can speak a bit to that. So, you know, we we've been having our SNAP nurse vaccination team going out uh, to all different rural parts of the county. Um, we've been making sure that there's testing access as well, um, and we've been working, you know, closely um, with on investigations um, with the, with the tribes and with United Indian Health Services, uh, and making sure that we're maintaining that support as well. So. Really, on all in all those areas, we've been making sure that there's access. Yeah, and I'll, if I just add a little bit to that. You know, um, in all the different branches of our response, COVID response investigations, the vaccination effort, our lab. You know, our tribal partners have been integral uh, part of those conversations, and um, you know, we really uh, have try to foster those relationships because we know this is a disease that affects that community uh, so much more. You know, the case, the, the, um, the impact on those communities is greater than the rest of the community as a whole in, in, in our county. So um, we, we definitely prioritize that and um, continue to do so as the um, pandemic continues. Holly, do you have a follow-up? I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, do you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I actually wanted to sort of piggyback on Austin's question about um, surge coming this winter and the potential um, lockdown measures, which are not expected, right? Um, but my question goes to the masking order. Um, there were certain metrics laid out last time we met and um, you know, the goalpost being, I think, was mid-January. If we hadn't met those metrics, um, Dr. Hoffman indicated that potentially um, there were other factors that would be considered in order to lift the masking mandate. And so at this point, I'm just wondering now, is that still on the table? Um, where are we at with those metrics? And, you know, taking into account the new variant, which is um, turning out highly transmissible. So if you could just comment on that. Thank you. Definitely. Great question. Um, a lot in there. So uh, let me try to get to everything. And then, um, Brian, feel free to follow up if we didn't cover it all. So first part, where are we at? Um, you know, case count wise, we're still uh, really hovering between red and orange on that CDC tracker. Um, you might have seen it dip into the yellow for like a half a day yesterday. That was really due to reporting um, lags from the, the Thanksgiving holiday. We see that a lot around weekends and holidays where there's a little bit of a lag. So, um, but case wise, you know, we're, we're still, you know, the old uh, metric, we'd be right around purple, uh, red tier. Um, so we still, like I mentioned, we still have pretty high case count. So we haven't even started to be into that lower case count threshold. That's the number one. Um, as far as the hospitalizations go, as I mentioned, we do continue to see fairly high hospitalizations. I mean, they've ranged from, you know, just under 10 to upwards of 15 over the course of the past couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, a year ago, 15 would have been really bad for the hospital. They're used to it now. They're, things are better, but I certainly think that it's not a state that we want to be looking to remove a lot of the precautions that, that are, are protecting the hospital. So, you know, we're going to be watching that. We're not there right now with, with hospitalizations. Um, as far as vaccination, again, I think the effort with the, the five to 11 year olds has been extremely successful. We're above the state average there. Um, we're above many of our counties surrounding us in Northern California uh, and, and um, you know, including some who have higher vaccination rates than us. So I, I'm very encouraged by that. If all of those folks complete theirs, 
uh, plus all the people who have one shot get their second shot, or you know, we get enough people getting their for their completion of their series. Um, we could be at 70%, you know, in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, the 80%, you know, is, is a goal for us to get to. And I, I still think, you know, could we get there by mid-January? Um, we'll see. I think, you know, Omicron is definitely something that is going to catch a lot of people's attention. And, um, you know, maybe that's the thing that, that motivates people to, to finally go out and get their vaccine. Maybe there's something else they want to go see their family for the holidays and get be protected. Um, they're, you know, they're getting the information from their doctors, from, you know, the medical community who is strongly supportive of the vaccine effort, whatever it is, if we, if we get there, um, there's still a chance to get there by January 15th. Um, and, and then lastly, you know, what happens if we're not there on January 15th? You know, we're going to be looking at that. It really depends on what the status of, you know, are we in a current new surge with, with cases or is, is Omicron really widely circulating? And what does that look like? Is it causing, you know, high levels of hospitalizations and severe disease? Um, you know, these were some of the reasons we kept these in place and didn't take it away earlier, like some other counties. Um, so we didn't end up going back and forth and back and forth. So, um, you know, we're going to be very, you know, um, we're going to stick to those guidelines. And if it looks like the right time to remove the mask mandate on January 15th, based on those guiding principles, that's what we'll do. Okay, thank you. I think you covered it for me on the masking question. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Kim? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, back in um, about November 1st, um, there was an advisory that went out about the high case rates in the Ill River Valley in certain zip codes. Um, and I'm just wondering, has anything sort of changed in that area in that interim time? Or are there higher vaccination rates or is it staying about the same where that area is still seeing that 60% or more of the cases? Yeah, thanks, Kim. Uh, good question. So um, case, cases have come down across the board, across the whole county. Um, so that is encouraging. So that, you know, a lot of that data was from when that peak was, you know, pretty high. And now that the, the case numbers are lower, they are also lower in the greater Fortuna area. Um, the, the update I got from our epi team yesterday was that they are still significantly higher in that area. So I, I don't think, you know, the, the numbers haven't changed a lot other than that they're just lower. So they're lower across the board and they're lower in the Fortuna area, but they're still higher in the Fortuna area than they are in the rest of the, the county. Um, I don't have any good um, geographic level data on the on progress with vaccines for that you know area it's um, something we could look at but we're constantly trying to target and do outreach in you know all of the geographic areas that have lower vaccination rates to make sure that there's plenty of opportunities and I, I think there's ample opportunity for people in the Fortuna area to get vaccinated um, so hopefully those who choose to will will go out and do so. Kim, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, sorry, I was just running. Um, so my follow would be, um, and I think you probably said you don't really have a good um, geographical level of progress on vaccination, but I'm just wondering if you have any anecdotal information on uh, progress of vaccines and when the 5 to 11 opened up in the greater Bill River Valley. Do you have any idea of like where people are getting those vaccinations? I don't. I think, you know, again, we made sure to include all geographic areas to try to, you know, hit for, uh, you know, in five to 11 year olds and in, in all populations. Um, so uh, that, you know, it's a, it's a small group. It's 10,000, around 10,000 is the population for five to 11 year olds in Humboldt County. And so we're about 2000 of those um, who've been vaccinated so far. Um, and most of them haven't been able to get their second shot yet because it's only been a couple of weeks. So the next couple of weeks, they'll be able to get fully vaccinated. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's something we'll pay attention to. We've always paid attention to that geographic, you know, zip code level, but it's a little too early to start to do any more targeting. I, I think right now we're still just in the messaging phase of, you know, get, please, you know, get your vaccine. It's safe. It's effective. Um, you know, it, it will protect you. It'll protect your community. Um, and, and, and including kids, you know, we do see, um, we've seen, uh, a, we've had a few local kids hospitalized, um, sent down to, to the Bay area for, for care because we don't have that kind of care here locally. Um, we've seen cases of severe disease that wasn't hospitalized in, in kids locally. And I think, you know, the, the data is, is very clear that when you compare COVID, uh, to other childhood diseases that we vaccinate against, um, you know, the number of hospitalizations and even deaths compared to things like say hepatitis, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, all of these things that we, we routinely vaccinate our children for, uh, COVID is causing many, many more times hospitalization and death than those other diseases that we already vaccinate our children for. So. It really makes sense for us to be vaccinating these kids to protect themselves, but also to protect all of us because they get sick, they go home, they get their family sick, they get grandma and grandpa sick. And then those are the people who are at the highest risk for going to the hospital. Um, so we're hoping that that message gets out. Um, more people continue to, to get the vaccine for kids. Again, 50% of, you know, uh, 12 to 17 year olds, it's, it's a great number. It will continue to go up as time goes on and more people you know, um, go ahead and get their vaccine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Ricardo, do you have another question? Yeah, what's the status of the Latino community of COVID? Yeah, so um, so the Latin, Latino community um, definitely has a higher uh, you know case rate as well, um, much like our native population, um, much like um, the black population um, in you know here locally, but also across the state and the country. Um, so we we have seen really in these. Um, these groups about a two to three times higher case rate. Um, and that results in higher hospitalizations and, and obviously higher deaths. So we have tried to focus our vaccination efforts in those areas as well and support, you know, both the tribal vaccination and also doing outreach to the um, Latinx community and making sure that um, they, there are opportunities, that there's Spanish speakers at, at all of our um, vaccination events, that there's information going out through channels that they um, trust and have confidence in. Um, and so the latest numbers, I was just looking at these yesterday, um, of the percent eligible in the, the Latinx community here in Humboldt County, 68.1% have gotten at least one shot. Um, so that's, you know, again, really encouraging. We um, had seen that be really low, 30, 40%, you know, five, six months ago. So we're clearly making really good progress in, in those. And it just takes time. It takes time for the, for the message to get out. It takes time for people to, you know, build their trust and confidence. And, and I think when people look around and see that three quarters of our community has gotten a shot and they're doing good and, and it's working, it's protecting them from the hospital, it's protecting them from severe disease, um, that, that that confidence is building. And so I think that's what we see reflected in that, those numbers for the uh, Latinx community as well. Austin, do you have another question? Yes, I do. Um, I know a big thing with this month being the holidays is travel. And so, of course, with the Om Omicron variant, should people be reconsidering out of, tra out of town travel this holiday season? And likewise, should people be hesitant about having family coming from out of town coming into Humboldt County? That's a great question. I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't 
I don't think there's any reason to panic over this. This is another variant and um, we will learn more about it. Um, but all the tools that we need to deal with it are already in place. We have the tools here in our country, in our county, um, and they're the same. They're masking, they're testing, and they're getting vaccinated. And if you're already vaccinated, getting a booster. So yes, anyone who's gonna be traveling, if you haven't gotten your vaccine, definitely start now so you've you know, got it before you do your holiday travels. If you're fully vaccinated, go get a booster. Um, that's definitely gonna be helpful. You know, wearing your mask while traveling. And then, yeah, I mean, considering what kind of gathering you're going to, you know, uh, obviously things like testing everyone at the gathering would be really, you know, helpful to reduce the risk doing things outdoors. Um, you know, we were really blessed with great weather here in Humboldt for Thanksgiving. So I know many, many people had their Thanksgivings outdoors. And so hopefully we'll see the same for other holidays coming up where people can, you know, do their traditional things, get together, um, see people you haven't seen in, you know, a year or two, um, and, and do it more safely with the tools that we've learned over the course of the pandemic. Um, uh, certainly, you know, international travel is something that, you know, people may be reconsidering at this point if they are, if they do have those plans. But I think otherwise, you know, we're not seeing uh, Omicron really circulating widely in the U.S. So I don't think there's any reason for alarm. We know that it's going to be here. We've caught the first case. There's got to be other cases. We know that. Um, it's just not circulating like it is in other parts of of Africa and Europe. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll see um, what happens here in the coming weeks. But at this point, um, I don't think it's a good, it's not a reason to, to throw out your plans and, and change everything. Great, thank you so much. I see that Isabella from the Time Standard just joined us. Isabella, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I would. I am so sorry. I I misread the invitation and was watching the governor's address, but thank you so much for admit me, admitting me. Um, that being said, since I did miss uh, part of this conversation, I don't know if this has already been covered, but um, you know, it has been reported that the Omicron variant has a theoretical advantage. And so I would ask um, why the county is choosing to essentially stay on the course as it has when that didn't work to curb uh, spread of the Delta variant in our community. That's a great question, Isabella, and I don't think we really specifically covered that one. Um, so it definitely has an advantage um, based on the theoretical mutations and, and how they interplay. It looks to have some support data-wise for that advantage in the, um, the data coming out of uh, South Africa. Um, so, you know, we're, we're we're taking the right precautions though. I mean, we already have a mask mandate in our county um, that, that many places in our country don't have. So we are actually taking more precautions than, um, and, and are well prepared for this. Um, testing is widespread in our community. It's easy to come by. And vaccines are also widespread and easy to come by. And those are all the same things that are gonna work against uh, Omicron as they are gonna work against all the variants. Um, you know. We, even if we see a spike in cases here, uh, I think given our level of vaccination, um, our masking order that's still in place and everything we've learned about COVID over the past 20 months, we're, we're in a better place than we were before Delta. You have to remember when Delta hit us, we did not have a masking order in place other than the state's uh, masking order for unvaccinated people and our vaccination rates were much, much lower at that point. Thank you. Do, do you want to ask a follow-up question, Isabella? Um, it's not totally a follow-up with that, but um, I was also wondering um, about getting um, booster shots in our community. I have, uh, if, I, I guess sort of um, the, would ask about the efficacy with the Omicron variant, if there's any evidence um, that that is necessary at this point, and then also um, whether there is a shortage of boosters in our community. So we are still learning about vaccine efficacy and natural, you know, immune response and the, the Omicron 
variant. So that is still, you know, jury's out. Uh, but we have every reason to think that the vaccines will have, you know, some and probably significant uh, uh, ability to protect us against the Omicron, just like it did with Delta. I think that the older age groups and those who are immunocompromised, I mean, that's who we've seen with Delta really get very sick, hospitalized, and even some deaths among those who are fully vaccinated. Um, with Delta, we are seeing a shift now that we're getting a lot of those folks boosted. Um, we haven't seen that as much. We haven't seen the hospitalizations and, and deaths in that fully vaccinated, boosted, highly uh, high risk group. So that's very encouraging. And that fits with what we're hearing from across the state with you know, boosters in skilled nursing facilities and high risk settings. Uh, really showing that protection against Delta. So we expect there to be significant protection. And so, yes, it's a reason to go get the booster. Um, you know, I, I think uh, some people are saying, well, should I wait until there's a specific booster for, for Omicron? And it's no, you shouldn't, because you don't wait to put your seatbelt on until you're 20 miles down the road. You put your seatbelt on now because you don't know when you're going to get hit. Right. Um, we don't know when that or if that might even be necessary. So they are working on it. The, the um, vaccine manufacturers are working very quickly to, to try to create a, a booster specific for this new variant. Um, it could be three to six months, though, before we see that. So we get boosted now. You get this vaccine now. And if it's necessary, we'll look at that in the future. Um, we just don't know right now. Just because they're working on it doesn't mean it's even going to be necessary. Thank you. Ali, do you have another question? Um, not right now. No, sorry. Thank you. Ryan, would you like to ask another question? Yes, thanks. I'll try to keep it quick. Um, so Dr. Hoffman, um, considering that, you know, we know no vaccine is without some side effects <clears throat> or adverse reactions in some percentage of people who are inoculated. And this goes for all vaccines. So um, considering the novel nature of the virus and mutations and all, um, I'm wondering what type of protocol is in place for healthcare staff, for example, emergency room staff or, or an attending doctor in a situation where a person does actually show an adverse reaction to the vaccine, if that should occur, um, what kind of protocol or reporting procedures are in place for um, reporting this? And would that then be reported to public health? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So, you know, the you're absolutely right, Ryan. Every vaccine has potential for side effects ranging from the vast majority of which are very mild uh, to a very small number of, uh, you know, high risk, uh, you know, bad outcomes. Those are, you know, again, the same as every vaccine, uh, risk benefit that, that we as the, the scientists and the doctors who, you know, decide should we move on with a vaccine versus not uh, have weighed out? And I, I'll just say the risks of, of COVID and this deadly pandemic that we've, we're living through are much, much greater for everyone, all ages, than the vaccine. The vaccine is by far the safest route to go. Um, so what, yes. what kind of things do we deal with? You know, minor things, most, you know, I mean, as many as, you know, uh, 10 to 20 percent of people will have some chills and some headache and some, you know, sore arm, um, things that are common uh, and they're easy to deal with. And everyone gets those instructions. Um, we have had a few cases locally in our own clinics and other places where, you know, people might um, have a, a reaction where they pass out. Again, something very common with many vaccines. We are all trained to deal with these when they happen, and they happen with a lot of vaccines. They happen with blood draws. They happen with people um, sometimes even just getting their blood pressure taken in a doctor's office. These are common things that happen in, in you know, our body's response to 
uh, medical procedures. So, um, you know, as far as true serious adverse reactions, um, we have not heard of really any, those should be elevated to us at public health when they occur, you know, like an anaphylaxis reaction um, or some other severe reaction. Those are supposed to be reported to us locally and to the CDC through the VAERS um, survey. And so we haven't really, you know, we haven't been alerted to, to any of these really severe reactions that let rise to the level of true anaphylaxis or, you know, someone um, really, uh, you know, being severely injured by, by the vaccine itself. Okay, thank you. Kim, would you like to ask one more question? Um, sorry. Um, so I was just curious if maybe you could um, talk a little bit about, you put out an advisory in the last 24 hours or so on the Omicron, Cron, I always want to pronounce, mispronounce it. Um, can you maybe just evaluate, uh, expand a little bit about sort of what advice you've given to local physicians about what to look for and what to be cautious about? Yeah, so it, it's very centralized on international travelers and just trying to get those folks tested. I don't think we know enough about anything else with this um, other than we just want to try to detect it. All the, the kind of reporting around the, the symptomato symptomology and, um, you know, yes, it does look like it spreads faster. That, that is also in that report. But otherwise, that's all we know. Probably spreads faster. Good evidence for that. We want to detect it. It's probably going to be found in international travelers at this point. And so we're going to focus on that. And that's really what the, the um, uh, update was about and, and encouraging local providers to send those, those PCR tests, get, to get them a PCR test um, if they test positive on an antigen or if they're seeking out um, you know, care after international travel to go ahead and get them a PCR test and send those to us so we can expedite them up to the folks who can get those um, sequenced quickly. Um, and, um, and I, one thing, sorry, just going back to Ryan's comments about the adverse reactions and the, um, the vaccines, you know, I just want to point out, we've, we've given hundreds of thousands of vaccines alone here in Humboldt County and, you know, millions and millions of vaccines across our country. So we know a lot about this vaccine and we know that the, the side effects are mild in most people and it's very rare to have a severe side effect. Well, thank you guys all for joining us. Thanks to the panelists and to the media representatives. Uh, that's about it on time. We will send the links out to the recording as soon as we have them and have a great day, everyone.